Hello everyone, DM Geezer Jim here to continue our RTFM. Reading the frickin' manual, uh, the polite version of the F part of that statement anyway. But yeah, welcome back. We're going through the 2024 Dungeon Master's Guide, word by word, line by line, section by section. Um, I, I am a, a big believer in reading content. I try to tell people over on the stream and any other DMs that I work with, did you read the book? And I'm starting to realize a lot of people have times, challenges in regard to reading. So I'm going to do us all a solid and, and try not to be a hypocrite. And we're going to RTFM. We're going to read the frickin' manual. We're going through the 2024 Dungeon Master Guide that was released about two weeks ago. I've been chatting a lot about it on my Twitch stream on a daily basis. So I just wanted to kind of take a break and get uh, not so much through the commentary as much as just reading it. So we're going to read through a couple sections here. Uh, we're picking up. This is our second episode. If you missed the first episode, go catch the first episode. We're going to go through preparing a session and, and ideally how to run a session in this video. I'm going to try to keep each of the videos around 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the first half of it, the first most of it, I should say, will be reading word for word. And the last little bit of it, I'm going to provide some commentary. Uh, but you will be hearing this dis disclaimer quite often. Remember that the 2024 Dungeon Masters Guide has been written for brand new Dungeon Masters. In my opinion, uh, this was the book that was designed for the guy that says, I want to play D&D. And no one wants to be the DM, and it sounds really hard, but what do I do? You read this book, and you're going to be very confident and very well prepared going into your first session. And it's going to give you a lot of tools to develop as a DM as you go forward. Enough of me blah, blah, blahing. Let's get to the reading. Oh, one last blah, blah, blah. I will be providing some personal commentary at the end of each of these little reading sections. I want to get through the content first, then we'll talk about a content, the content a little bit at the end of it. So we're picking up at preparing a session. Chapter 1, The Basics, Preparing a Session. The more you prepare before your game, the more smoothly the game will go to a certain point. To avoid being either under or over prepared, use the one hour guidelines below and prioritize what to prepare depending on the time you have available. Uh, the one hour guideline, emphasis on guideline. In d, &D game sessions usually starts with some out of game chatter as everyone settles down to play. Once the session gets underway, most groups can accomplish at least three things during one hour of play, where each three thing might be any of the following. Explorer locations, such as a chamber in a castle or a cave. Uh, converse with an intelligent creature. Reach consensus on a div divisive issue. Solve a tricky riddle or puzzle. Survive a deadly trap. Fight a low difficulty combat encounter. A more difficult combat encounter might count as two or three things, and a tense negotiation can use most or all of an hour of play on its own. Preparation time. The following guidelines can help you prepare for a session of play using a published adventure. One hour preparation. If you spend one hour each week preparing for your game, follow these steps. Step one. Focus on the story of the adventure. Read or reread the adventure's introduction background inf information. Create a bulleted list of key plot points to make sure a coherent story continues to unfold. Step two, ident identify the encounters you want to run, then figure out how likely it is each encounter will get played, categorizing, categorizing each one as definite, possible, or unlikely. Step three, gather any maps you'll need for the definite and possible encounters, then focus on the remainder of your prep time on the definite encounters as outlined below. For combat encounters, review the monster's tactics and stat blocks. Note any special rules that apply to the setting of the encounter. For social interactions, for social interaction encounters, make notes about the NPCs, the non-player characters, in the encounter, their personalities, their goals, and their tactics. For exploration encounters, record any clues or other information that the character should learn and review any special rules that might come into play in the encounter. Step four, consider how each definite encounter relates to the player's motivations. See, know your players in chapter two. Think about elements you can add to interest them. For example, a combat encounter could open with a tense negotiation designed to appeal to players who enjoy social interaction. Step five, skim the encounters that you thought as you flagged as possible. That's your one hour prep. Two hour preparation. With another hour to prepare, add these steps. Step six, carefully review each possible encounter. Step seven, devote any time you have left to creating improvis improvisational aids. See improvising answers in chapter two. 
Three hour preparation. If you have three hours to prepare, add these steps. Skim each unlikely encounter. Step nine, create a new encounter designed to appeal specifically to one player or alter an existing encounter to relate to the goals and the motivations of that player's character. Over the course of several sessions, do this for all your players and their characters. Okay, how to run a session. This is gonna be a little bit thicker here, but let's do it. This section explains how to run a game session. Later on in chapters four and five, we'll detail how to combine sessions into adventures and adventures into campaigns. The recap. Start each game session after the first with a recap of what happened in the previous session. A recap helps the players get back into the story. It also provides important information to players who missed the previous session. You can provide this recap or you can invite one or more players to deliver the recap instead. Each approach has its benefits. A DM recap provides the, providing the recap yourself if you have specific information you need to impart or if you want the recap to be concise and focused on what's relevant. Player recap. Let the players provide the recap if you want to gauge what they think is important or learn more about what they're getting out of the game. If the players miss any important details in their recap, you can interject a reminder. The next thing of how to run a session is encounters. The bulk of a typical D&D session consists of a series of encounters similar to how a movie is a series of scenes. In each encounter, there's a chance for the DM to describe creatures and places and for characters to make choices. Encounters can involve exploration, for example, interacting with the environment, including puzzles. It can also include social interaction with creatures or combat. The Player's Handbook outlines the general rhythm of play in an encounter. The following sections offer more detailed information on how an encounter typically unfolds in three steps. Step 1. Describe the situation. As the DM, you, describe, you decide how much to tell the players and when. All the information the players need to make choices comes from you. Within the rules of the game and the limits of the character's knowledge and senses, tell the players everything they need to know. Within the rules of the game and the limits of the character's knowledge and senses, tell the players everything they need to know. Yes, I read that twice. Published adventures often include text in a box like this, which is meant to be read, al read aloud to the players when their characters first arrive at a location or under a specific circumstance as described in the text. It usually describes locations so the players know what's happening and have a sense of what their character's options are. Whether you're running a published adventure or one of your own creation, your initial description of a room or situation should focus on what the characters can perceive. You don't have to reveal every detail at once. Most players begin to lose focus after about three sentences of descriptive text. As characters search rooms, open drawers and chests, and examine things more closely, give players more details about what their characters find. The narration section in Chapter 2 offers more extensive advice and examples of narration. Step two, let the players talk. Once you're done describing the situation, ask the players what their characters want to do. Note what the players say and identify how to resolve their actions. Ask them for more information if you need it. Sometimes the players might give you a group answer. We go through the door. Other times individual players might want to do specific things. One might search a chest while another examines a bookshelf. Outside of combat, the characters don't need to take turns but you need to give each player a chance to tell you what their character is doing so you can decide how to resolve everyone's actions. In combat, everyone takes turns in initiative order. Step three, describe what happens next. After the players have described the character's actions, it's the DM's job to resolve those actions guided by the rules and the adventure you've prepared. So how do you decide? Think through these possibilities. No rules required. Sometimes resolving a situation is easy. If an adventurer wants to cross an empty room and open a door, you can just say that the door opens and describe what lies beyond, perhaps referencing your maps or your notes. Obstacles to success. A lock, a guard, or some other obstacle might hinder a character's ability to complete a task. In those cases, you typically call for a D20 test, usually an ability check. For example, a successful dexterity, sleight of hand check, might be needed to pick the lock while well, a successful charisma or persuasion check and some coins might be needed to bribe the guard. The resolving outcome section in chapter 2 gives more guidance on how to use D20 tests and other tools to determine the results of characters' actions. 
Role playing. When the players interact with other creatures, role playing those creatures based on whether they are friendly, indifferent, or hostile. Improvise uh, based on what you know about these creatures, their knowledge, and their motivations. Then bring these creatures to life as you describe what happens. See running social interaction section in chapter 2 for more advice. One action at a time. The rules about actions in the player's handbook limit how many things a character can do at once. Keeping those rules in mind can help you educate situations. In combat, many situations involve attack rolls or savings throws. Uh, the rules of combat can help you determine the effectiveness of characters' actions. The running combat section in Chapter 2 offers advice on combat. Spell casting. If a character casts a spell, you can usually let the player tell you what the spell does and how to resolve it. If questions arise, read the text of the spell yourself. How a spell is supposed to work is usually pretty clear. The general rules of spell casting in the player's handbook are also essential for resolving a spell's effects. Exceptions supersede general rules. General rules cover, govern each part of the game, but the game also includes class features, spells, magic items, monster abilities, and other elements that can contradict a general rule. When an exception and a general rule disagree, the exception wins. For example, it's a general rule that melee weapon attacks using the character's strength modifier. But if a feature says a character can make the melee weapon attack using charisma, that exception supersedes the general rule. When narrating results, try to give a flavorful description while clearly communicating what's happening in the language of the game. See Narration and Combat section in Chapter 2 for more advice and examples. Describing results often leads to another decision point, which refers, returns the flow of the game to Step 1. So, passing time is our next session, our next section here. The game has a rhythm and flow that includes periods of action and excitement interspersed with lulls. Think of how movies show the time passing between scenes. When an encounter ends, you can move on to the next one. You can often gloss over hours of travel with a quick narrative summary. See the travel section in Chapter 2 for more advice. Similarly, if a rest period passes uneventfully, tell the players that and then move on. Don't make the players spend time discussing what the characters cook uh, which character cooks what for dinner unless they enjoy such descriptions? It's okay, okay to gloss over mundane details and return to the action as quickly as possible. Expect players to discuss the events of the game, spend time planning, and engage in long conversations in character. You don't need to be involved in those discussions unless they have questions for you. Learn to recognize the times when you can take a break as a DM and then resume the action as soon as everyone's ready. Sidebar, taking breaks. When you finish a lengthy combat encounter or a tension-filled scene, or if you need time to think, take a quick break. Give your brain a few moments to refocus, relax, or prepare for the next encounter. It's okay to leave the players in suspense during a break while you figure out the consequence of their actions. Good advice. Next part of here is examples of play. Ending a session. Uh, try not to end a game session in the middle of an encounter. It happens, but try not to. It's difficult to keep track of information such as initiative order and other round-by-round -round details between sessions. An exception to this guideline is when you purposefully end in a session with a cliffhanger where the story pauses just as something monumental happens or some surprising turn of events occurs. A cliffhanger can keep players intrigued and excited until the next session. If a player missed a session, you had that player character's player characters leave player's character, sorry, leave the party for a while, make sure there's a way to bring the character back when the player returns. Sometimes a cliffhanger can serve this purpose. The character charges in to help their beleaguered companions. Allow a few minutes at the end of play for everyone to discuss the events of a session. Ask your players what parts of the session they liked and what they would like to have seen more. Takes notes on what happened in the situation at the end of the session, so you refer back to those notes as you prepare the next session. The next section is examples of play. Uh, these pages present a short example of play similar to the ones in the player's handbook to illustrate how everything outlined in the how to run a session section works in practice. In this example, the dungeon master is running an adventure, the fouled stream from chapter 4. The four players are Amy, playing Aro, a halfling rome, rogue, Maeve, playing Mirabella, an elf wizard, Philip, who is playing Gareth, a human cleric, and Russell is playing Shreve, a goliath fighter. 
The DM starts by asking the players to recap the action of the previous session, most of which consists of creating characters. Jared is the DM. Last session, we met our four heroes in the little farming village of High Erie. Who remembers what happened? Amy says we're at a village council meeting about the weird. We're at a village council meeting about the weird stuff in the river making the fish inedible. We volunteer to investigate. Russell says so. We set out and followed the river upstream. At the first fork, we met a tree ant named Burrow Grove, who pointed us to a cave that was the source of the polluted stream. Amy says before he wandered off, he gave us a magic acorn, and that's where we ended last week. The DM says, Jared, so now you're in this gloomy forest. Dry leaves rustle under your feet. You're still beside the stream, which looks murky and wholesome beneath the shadowy trees. What do you want to do now? Russell, uh, we continue upstream? The others nod. Uh, Jared, okay, you make your way upstream for about another hour. The farther you go, the murkier and stinkier the water becomes. Rounding a bend, you can see a cave in the hillside ahead of you. The stream tumbles from the cave mouth. There are withered shrubs clumped around the cave, apparently poisoned by this nasty water. Philip, into the cave. Uh, DM asks, who's leading the way? Sidebar. The DM knows something that the players don't. The withered shrubs are actually monsters. It's important to establish which characters are closest to the hidden monsters. That's why Jared says, who's leading the way? Russell says, I'll go first. Jared says, the cave entrance is 10 feet wide with the stream running right down the middle. Do you want to go single file or two abreast? Philip says, I don't love the idea of stepping across the stream. Let's go single file, staying on the side of the water. Everyone else agrees. Sidebar two. By asking the players to choose their character's marching order, the DM cleverly pivots away from the withered shrubs. The players don't realize their characters are in danger, and the DM is waiting for the right time to reveal the hidden monsters. Jared says, okay, who's second? Philip says, Gareth will go second. Uh, Mirabella goes third, and Amy goes, uh, I'll make sure nothing's following us. So, DM says, okay, Shreve, as you reach the cave mouth, you hear the shrubs rustling. <clears throat> Russell says, oh, I should have checked to make sure nothing was hiding in the shrubs. In fact, the shrubs themselves are moving. They're not rude at all. Each one has two little legs and sharp claws. Everyone, roll for initiative. <coughs> Russell, how many shrubs are attacking? Six. Aro, what's your initiative? Amy got a 14. Shreve goes on a 5. Maeve gets a 21. And Gareth gets a 19. Sidebar. The DM rolls initiative just once for all six monsters and writes down that they'll go on initiative count 17. The DM then goes around the table to get each player's initiative. See running section, combat section, and chapter 2 for advice about rolling and tracking initiative. Uh, Mirabella says, Jared, you're first. What do you want to do? Uh, Maeve says, how many, walk how many of these walking bundles of kindling can I get in a 15-foot cone? Uh, Jared says, there are three on your side of the stream and three on the other. You can get either group in your cone. The DM doesn't have sidebar. The DM doesn't have the exact position of these monsters mapped on a grid, but it's fair to assume that they're clumped close together as they move to attack the characters. Maeve, Mirabella puts her thumbs together and wiggles her fingers. Uh, fire shoots out from her fingers, catching the ones on our side of the stream. Burning hands. The DM says, okay, what do I need to do? It's always fair on the sidebar. It's always fair to the DM to expect players to explain what their spells and abilities to do. The DM has enough to keep track of. Huge, huge, huge thing to remember. That's not your job. Uh, Maeve says the shrub things need to make dexterity 14 saving throws. The DCs are 14. Uh, and Jared says, and how much damage do they take? Maeve says uh, rolls 3d6 for the spell's damage. 13 fire damage they failed. 6 if they succeeded. Jared says magical fire tears through them and leaves smears of ash behind. Anything else, Mirabella? Sidebar. Asking for the spell's damage allows the DM to roll a saving throw for each monster and mark off the right amount of damage for that one. In this case, though, the monsters have vulnerability to fire damage because they're shrubs, and so few hit points they, desi they die no matter what they roll. It's important to make sure you're asking for damage even if you know they're toast. Maeve says, my work here is done. She minds blowing the smoke away from her fingertips. DM says, Gareth, you're up next. Philip says, Gareth holds his holy symbol and utters an imprecation while pointing at the closest shrub and casting Toll the Dead. The sound of a bell tolls and the shrub makes a wisdom save, DC 14. DM says, well, I rolled a one. It takes seven necrotic damage. Uh, whatever moisture was in this bundle of killing seems to, kindling seems to dry up and the thing keels over dead. Anything else, Gareth? Uh, Philip says he glares menacingly at the other shrubs. Uh, DM Jared says, okay, their turn. One skitters towards Mirabella. Russell says, can I interject myself between it and Mirabella? 
Jared says, sure, I'll allow it. You step into the monster's path, and the monster makes an attack roll for the monster, which is not going to hit. It tears at your cloak, but fails to wound you. The other one has lost any interest in fighting. It starts running away. Now it's Aro's turn. Sidebar. It's not Shreve's turn, but the DM decides to allow the Goliath fighter to step in the way of the monster's attack, but it gives because it gives Shreve a fun, heroic moment. The DM changes the monster's target to Shreve and makes an attack roll. So this is the improvisation. We're going to improv this. According to rules written, Shreve shouldn't have been able to move, but the DM made the ruling because it sounded fun. Aro looks at the one that just attacked Shreve and pulls out a dagger. I get a 23 to hit. That hits. What's your next damage? Since Shreve is next to it, I can use my sneak attack. It takes 12 piercing damage. Uh, the DM says, it's felled. Mirabella, the last one, is running away. Will you let it escape? Maeve says, I think Borogrove would be disappointed in us if we let it escape. I'll cast Firebolt, getting a 14 to hit. Uh, the DM says, you nailed it. Maeve says, it takes 10 fire damage. Jared says, yeah, the last shrub incinerated. Well done. So that's your example of a quickly set up. Uh, we walk into up a stream. We get to a cave. We fight the fight. It's just a dialogue to give you examples uh, of, of what it looks like. Um, so let's go ahead and get up back up here for commentary mode, right? So, um, preparing a session and running a session is what we did in this section here, right? The preparing a session, remember, this is my commentary. This is just a starting point. The one hour guideline is just a guideline. If you only got 10 minutes, but you're good at making stuff up, then you use 10 minutes, you make stuff up. If you've got five or six hours to plan an encounter, my golly, use all the time you want. But this, the, the guidelines are exactly that, just something to help you what do I need to plan for when I set up a game? That's the idea here, is we're informing a new dungeon master that there is some preparation involved, and this is what that preparation can look like. At the bare minimum, day one, when you're getting ready to dungeon master, this is what your prep can look like. That's what this section is designed for, no more, no less. Experienced DMs, we all have our own prep ways, we all have our own method, we all have our own timetables. Wizards of the Coast is not trying to tell you that you need to change your stuff to one hour guideline. This section is designed to tell the brand new DM, hey, welcome to being a dungeon master. When you get ready to run this adventure, you should plan on having at least an hour to prepare. And if you have that hour, this is what it can look like to begin with. When you find your own groove, you're going to uh, you're gonna deviate from this guideline. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the preparation time, one hour prep, two hour prep, three hour prep. But the main things that I hope that you gather here is you should have an idea of the most important thing that's going to happen this session. And you, could, you should spend most of your time on that particular point. Uh, you don't want to plan 50 random encounters if you're not even leaving the town. Okay, If your party's not leaving home base because they're about to have a dialogue, you don't need to come up with the 20 tribes of orcs that live on the mountain uh, 100 miles away. Make sure that you are using the time that you have to prep for that session for that session, at least early on. Eventually, you'll get your own workflow, and no one can tell you how to change your workflow, but establishing a workflow is the key here, okay? So that's that's really the thing they're talking about in the preparation time, the one-hour guideline. An example of it, the DM recap. I do appreciate this, and I'm actually a big fan of recap number two. Let the players provide the recap if you want to gauge what they think is important. Learn about what they're getting out of the game. Uh, having them recap a session is going to give you feedback without having to ask for feedback. They're going to remember what was fun. They're going to remember what was scary. They're going to remember what sucked. They're all going to remember the highlights. The extremes of a session come through the player's recap. So that lets you focus on things that you're preparing for or including things that you know that they're into and they're interested in. Instead of telling them, hey, this is what we did last session, and we're going to continue with that. So letting the players give the recap can inform you as a dungeon master um, on what you're doing right, what they're enjoying a lot of, what they want to see more of, and what they didn't like, what scared them. So player recaps are very, very helpful. The next section in regards to the encounters, this is enough to describe the basics of it. Chapter 2, Chapter 3 gets into a lot of detail uh, in, in specifics on these. But this is a good guide to see what happens. Uh, I, first, I tell you what you see, where you are, what you smell, what you're doing. Then the players tell, us, tell me what they're going to do in response to that. Then I tell them the consequences of their decisions. And it goes back and forth like that. That's, that's what a basic encounter is. Whether it's exploration, whether it's dialogue, whether it's combat, whether it's all three wrapped together, it's still the same exchange. 
this is what you see, this is what you smell, this is what you hear, uh, this is what's moving over there. And then the players go, well, we don't like that smell. Uh, we don't like hearing that sound and we see that thing moving over there, so we're going to go the other way. And then it comes back to me and I tell them what happens because of their consequence. That's all this section is here to do, is to, is to give you a... a uh, a brief example of what this situ the, what the encounters look like through the dialogue thing, the passing time, the examples of play thing that we read. Passing time is a good uh, is some good advice here. You use the time as you need to. If your party is enjoying uh, the long term role play and they're not worried in a history in, in, about moving the story forward right now, then you let it go. If you don't want to charge, uh, if you don't want to play through every hour of travel, you don't have to. You pass time with what helps you get to the point uh, in the adventure that you need and what keeps the players immersed and engaged. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here is I really like this section here. Expect players to discuss the events of a game, spend time planning, and engage in long conversations in character. You, me, and you, the GMs, do not need to be involved in these discussions unless they have questions for you. Learn to recognize the times when you can take a break in the D as a DM and resume the action as soon as everyone's ready. If the players are having a good conversation, you don't need to have the Steve Buscemi skateboard kid go up and, greetings, adventurers, what are we doing? Let them have their moment. Let them have their fun. Let them engage, being enjoy being characters without you being there. The, there's, there's few and far time, the times are few and far between that you won't be involved in every aspect of the game. So when the players are uh, adopting a moment on their own, uh, I like this advice. Shut your mouth, sit down until they ask for you. Let them enjoy the moment. Let them build their connection together. That's a very, very good piece of advice. Uh, ending a session, try not to end on a cliff in the middle of an encounter. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. You don't want to get to where you're nerfing encounters because there's only 30 minutes left today. And uh, shit, if I have the second wave of bad guys come in, we're not going to fight the game. We're not going to finish tonight. So... I guess I'll just make this encounter easy so we can finish all. Sometimes you're going to have to pause mid-encounter. Sometimes you're going to have to pause mid-combat. Make sure you're taking your notes for that. Ideally, you don't want to do that more often than not because it can break the rhythm and it can break the intensity of, a, of, of an, a combat encounter. Especially if you miss a couple sessions, then no one even cares about the fight, right? And the last section was examples of play. This is pretty good. Uh, mainly what I would suggest as you read this, or if you listen to me read this, make sure that uh, you pay attention to the sidebar stuff. Uh, the you know Off to the right side as we read through it, the sidebars. Those are giving you examples of when a DM is playing under behind the screen. He does, the bad guys don't, or the players don't know that the bushes are bad guys. It gives you an example of a DM making a, a rule of cool. Uh, yeah, technically Sheev can't move right now, but... It sounds fun, so I'll let him do it. I'll let him suddenly move out of initiative to take the attack from their other player. That's an example of, of a, a, a DM allowing for player creativity, allowing for an improvised moment for more fun. Okay? So that's where we're going to end this section here. Uh, uh, part two, we covered preparing for a session and how to run a session, including examples of play. Our next section will be every DM is unique. So... Thank you so much. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Likes, follows, subscribes. Comments are appreciated. Uh, I need feedback to know if I need to do better, more, less, more. If you need more commentary, if you need less commentary, if you uh, have something that you're thinking about, drop it in the comments below. And likewise, if, you're in, uh, if you want to get more involved in some of our discussions, feel free to join us over on Twitch. We're there 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. U.S. Central Standard Time, Tuesday through Saturday. We're just chatting D&D, man. Uh, I've been playing and running games since 1983. Um, but I'm running 5e right now, so a lot of it's, you know, taking old content and turning it into new, talking about how to adapt to a modern game, things like that. Would love to have you along. But above all else, thank you for your time, whether you've been here for 30 seconds, whether you've been for a whole series. Your time is a valuable thing, and I greatly appreciate you sharing it with us. Push that button, push that like button, that subscribe button. We'll be here for, and we'll be doing this for the whole book. Uh, and if we get enough of a, a good enough good feedback from it, I, hell, I might do the, the player's handbook next on an audio book. We'll see. Y'all be safe. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon.